Hi, everyone. Uh, it's Dr. Mindy here. Um, this is Unit 17 on Decision Making. Uh, this is the lecture that I would have given on uh, Monday, uh, the 20th, if I would have been here. Um, I'm not here, uh, so that's why I'm making this recording for you. Uh, let's back up just a little bit, um, talk about a little bit what we did uh, last week, uh, and then I'll try to put it all together. So last week, I talked about Bayes' theorem and probability theory. One of the things you should have taken from that is that it can be really challenging for humans to use probability. Uh, we don't often have access to uh, the base rates. We don't often have access to the uh, overall likelihoods. And so we do the best that we can uh, with the information that we have at hand. Uh, what I want to talk about today, though, are two different theories uh, that account for a lot of human decision-making behavior. Uh, the first of these is a rational model, and one of the things we'll see pretty quickly is that the rational model depends on having access to probability. So it starts to fall apart, uh, and uh, it doesn't always account for uh, human behavior uh, because humans don't often have that basic understanding of probability. Uh, but nonetheless, we want to start with this idea of an expected value uh, and sort of an optimal or rational way uh, to be able to make decisions. And then we'll talk about some of the deviations, talk about some of the cognitive errors and biases that we have, and we'll talk about an alternative to the rational model, which is prospect theory. So the idea that we make rational decisions um, is uh, an idea that comes from behavioral economics. Uh, so a rational decision is one that maximizes uh, the benefit for us, minimizes the cost, and reduces uncertainty. Um, and the idea is that we weigh the alternatives. If we're making a decision among uh, three or four different alternatives, we weigh the alternatives and we make that appropriate decision. So what is an expected value? Um, starting with this rational model, we assume that people set this value for all of the alternatives and they choose the most valuable one. So we have to have some way to uh, calculate an expected value for all of the alternatives we're considering. Let's use some really simplified examples. Um, maybe these would be like bets or gambles, uh, and these would be, <laughs> these would be really obvious uh, bets or gambles. These aren't as complicated as the kind of gambling that might be uh, seen in a casino or a sports betting where there's lots of different things to keep straight. Uh, so look at these two alternatives. Um, one alternative uh, is that Engaging in some behavior, you can win $40 with a probability of 0.2, or else you don't win anything. So that's choice number one. You win $40 with a 20% probability or nothing. The other alternative uh, is uh, that you can win $35 with a probability of 2.5, 25%, uh, or else you don't win anything. So before you think too strongly, too deeply into this, before you think about trying to calculate anything, which of these two seems better to you? Uh, you only got one choice, which one seems better? Um, there's no right answer, there's no wrong answer, though the, pros the rational model was going to give you the um, best possible answer, the most rational choice. Uh, suppose you choose $40 because you like the idea of getting $40, right? It's a little bit more. It's the higher value. Um, but remember, it's combined with a slightly lower probability. So on any given choice, you have a slightly lower chance of winning that $40. The second choice, uh, is a $35 win. Uh, so it's a little bit lower, but you have, a, you have more of a chance of getting it. Uh, so you have to think about both of these things in conjunction. Um, so if we were in class, I would say, how many of you would choose the first one? Uh, and some of you might raise your hand. And then I would say, how many of you would choose the second one? Some of you might raise your hand. But let's look at what the rational model would say. In other words, objectively, if you had all of this information and you could calculate an expected value and you were going to be making this decision in the long run, which one pays off the most? And that's an important thing to keep in mind is that these expected values are calculated with what gives you the most in the long run. So looking at option number one, uh, you could win $40 with a probability of 0.2 or else you get nothing. Uh, so in order to calculate that, the EV, in this case, stands for expected value, is that you would take what you could win and you multiply it by the probability of winning. So $40 times 0.2. That's what you can get. That's the gain. And then you take away from that the potential loss. Now, this one doesn't cost you anything, but you have an 80% chance of not getting anything because most of the time if you engage in this behavior or if you take this gamble or if you make this wager, uh, you're not going to get anything. Uh, 
So if you did this over the long run, in other words, if you did this you know, forever, uh, on average, each time you engage in this bet or each time you take this bet, uh, your average expected value is $8. So a lot of the time you're winning nothing. 80% of the time you're winning nothing, but 20% of the time you're winning $40. If you average together all of those wins and losses, every time you do this, on average, you're gaining $8. Does that make sense? So it's you're never actually gaining $8 on a single bet, uh, but over the long haul, each bet is worth, uh, on average, $8. Uh, so... That seems pretty good. Uh, no matter what you do, you make $8 on average. Um, the second one, though, it's a lower win, but a higher probability. So when you take the $35, multiply it by $25, take from that and then subtract from that the 0 times 0.75, uh, this one actually is worth a little bit more, $8.75. It's not a lot more, but on average, if you played this game or if you engaged in this behavior uh, or if you... Uh, took this wager for, you know, in the long run, uh, each one of them would be on average $8.75. In other words, this is the better one. So on a single behavior, on a single bet, uh, you might be tempted to go with the $40 one because it has the higher value. But the rational choice is to choose the $35 bet because on average, you have a better chance of getting the money. Uh, if you have to do this over many uh, days, or if you had to do this over many uh, choices, uh, if you had to do this over a long run, uh, that second choice, winning $35 with a probability of 0.25, is the better choice. So you can see why the rational model makes sense. Uh, it gives you the tools to sort of dispassionately look at the options and determine which one is the better choice. Even if the initial attraction to the $40 seems a little higher, uh, when you think about the probabilities, uh, the second one is the better choice. Of course, uh, you know, the example that I gave you uh, at the beginning is pretty, pretty simplified. Uh, there's no loss. Um, but you can do this also with losses. Uh, so suppose you have a $40 win with a probability of 0.2, or else you lose $5 each time. Now the risks are a little bit higher, right? So every time you lose something... Uh, you're going to, um, it's going to cost you something. Uh, so you can still calculate these the same way. So you've got $40 times 0.2, and you subtract from that all of the potential losses, $5 times 0.8. Uh, this gives you a much lower expected value. So you can see that on average, uh, this, one, this one costs a little bit more. Uh, the second choice is still better, though. Uh, the second choice is better because uh, you have a higher probability of getting that $35 and a lower probability of still losing $5. So that's a $5 uh, expected value. That's still the better choice across the long run. Most of us, most of us don't follow expected value when we're gambling. Uh, otherwise, none of us would gamble, right? I mean, uh, whether it's sports betting or uh, casino gambling or lottery tickets or any other kind of gambling, for the most part, uh, sure, you can, you can do well. Uh, but for the most part, there's a negative expected value. It just costs you more. And there's some reasons why uh, we still do it. Um, take lottery tickets, for example. So whether they're scratch-off lottery tickets or, uh, you know, pick three or pick four type numbers or uh, the longer sort of multi-state or multi-province uh, lotteries. Uh, any of these are going to have a negative expected value. And on the surface, that makes sense because... Most of these official lotteries are designed uh, to make money for the to make money for whoever's putting on the lottery, right? If this is a an Ontario uh, lottery, it's designed to make money for Ontario. Uh, so the expected value. This is just from a, um, a general website uh, on uh, expected values and lotteries. Expected value for lottery uh, bets is not that great in the United States, for example. An expected value of minus fifty is the usual. In other words, uh, whatever the value uh, of that particular um, uh, bet, it's always going to be uh, a massively, massively uh, negative value. 50% of the overall value uh, is the usual. That means you can be in the hole twice what you invested uh, after spending money on buying lottery tickets. Uh, no matter how much you spend on lottery tickets, with the exception of the one or two people, uh, over millions of people who 
buy a ticket and make a lot of money, almost everyone's going to end up uh, in the hole. It's designed to make money for the province. It's designed to make money for a state. So we make mistakes. I mean, the rational model gives us a, a prescriptive um, account of how we should be making decisions, uh, but uh, most of the evidence suggests that we don't behave rationally, or at least we don't behave in accordance with a rational model. We often make decisions that are not in our best interest, uh, and we make decisions that uh, suggest we use our memories and our experiences rather than access to uh, probability and access to expected value. Now, I want to talk about a few of these violations, but keep in mind that there's a lot of good reasons for why we make mistakes. I mean, uh, we don't usually have the base rates uh, for events. We don't usually have uh, things like the exact probability of how much you're going to win and the exact probability of how much you're going to lose. So when we're given some of these examples, uh, these uh, rational model examples, sure, we get the basic information. We have all of the probability information and all of the uh, costs and benefits, but it's not something that we're designed to use. I mean, we just don't usually have that information. So even when presented with it, we often ignore it because the information we're used to using uh, is our own memory and experiences. Most of the time, that's going to guide us in the right direction, uh, but sometimes we're going to make errors. So let's talk about three different kinds of mistakes. Uh, we're going to talk about certainty effects. And when I say mistakes, I mean that these are mistakes relative uh, to the rational model. These may not always uh, be mistakes uh, for us on a short-term basis. Let's talk about certainty effects, framing effects, and then we'll revisit some of the heuristics and biases that we already talked about. So we talked about some of those last week, but I want to talk about them again in the context of uh, the rational model and in the context of the prospect theory, uh, which we'll introduce in just a minute. So let's talk about certainty effects. Um, certainty effects, uh, you might have already started to see some of that when I presented the first uh, expected value theory uh, example, which was uh, choosing between a $40 and a $35 choice. And I said, perhaps maybe the $40 seems a little bit better, right? Uh, it seems like you know, on, on, you've got a low probability of both of them, but something about that larger value uh, seems like it's a little bit more attractive. We can also do this with probability. So if you have the uh, understanding or the belief uh, that you are certain to get something, uh, you'll often choose something with a lower expected value. So if you were given the option to win $40 with a probability of 0.8, it's a high probability, uh, or $30 with a probability of 1.0, in other words, I'm just going to hand you $30, uh, you might take that choice, uh, even though it has a lower expected value. Uh, it's a guarantee, right? Uh, the other one, the $40 choice, has a pretty high probability too, but the second one, it's an immediate gain. Uh, and one of the things we're going to see over the next few slides and over the course of this lecture is that uh, uncertainty is something that most of us, most humans and most animals, don't like. We don't like uncertainty, and decision-making is often about reducing uncertainty. Uh, and even something like this, which is a you know, a small value, $30, if it's going to reduce uncertainty by guaranteeing that you get it, uh, you may be more likely uh, to take that choice. So let's look at a real-world example. I mean, most of us have a smartphone of some kind, whether it's an Android phone or an Apple phone, uh, and you probably take it for granted uh, just the existence of them. Um, but remember, like 10, 12 years ago, uh, the iPhone was a new device, uh, and um, it, there hadn't yet been anything quite like it. So a phone uh, that had uh, that needed access to the internet uh, and not just uh, making calls uh, and not just uh, sending text messages, but a phone that could really benefit from being attached uh, to the same data uh, stream uh, to do things like email and uh, photos and social media hadn't yet uh, become such a big part of things. But uh, all of the things that we take for granted now uh, are made possible by having you know, unlimited or high caps on how much internet access you can use. Uh, so when the phone first came out, when Apple and AT&T, this is from a, a, an article in the New York Times way back in 2009, uh, which was already talking about uh, the Apple iPhone uh, as something in the past. Uh, so when Apple and AT&T first started offering the iPhone, um, <laughs> look at how cheap it was, uh, for $199 
plus $30 a month for internet access. By the way, this was unlimited access. That's a terrific plan. I wish I still had that. So you buy the phone, you spend $30 a month uh, for unlimited access. Uh, sales shot up. So that was actually, you know, when they came up with that deal, $199 plus $30 a month, uh, it really increased the number of phones people were buying. Even though the previous deal, uh, so when it first came out, was $400, $399 for the phone with only $20 a month for unlimited access. Um, it cost less over the two-year contract. So the first deal, $399 and $20, cost less than the second deal, which was $199, plus $30 a month. Why do you think people like that $199 uh, plus $30 a month, which the numbers on the left there, by the way, that's how much the phone would cost over the two years. So in the original plan, it would be $879 over two years. In the second plan, it would be $919 uh, over two years. Uh, people like the, f the, the one at the top, uh, the one that starts with $199, uh, because you get a new phone for less up front. Uh, in other words, it seems like certainty. It's a pseudo-certainty effect. You're spending a little bit more to get a phone now, uh, whereas the second uh, option, uh, the one that was the original option, $399, the expected costs over the two years are lower, uh, but the upfront costs are higher. And so people were, you know, understandably sort of, you know, put off on that. Uh, not so much, you know, it's still a good deal, uh, but you have to lay out more up front. Um, so taking that, uh, it soon became the norm for most providers uh, to offer you a new phone for zero dollars or you know fifty dollars or forty nine dollars. You go to Rogers or Bell now and you can get a new phone uh, for almost nothing, uh, except that you have to spend uh, much more than twenty dollars a month. Uh, for the contract. Uh, so you need to have this uh, two-year contract over the long haul in order to be able to afford the phone. By the way, just as an aside here, it's kind of remarkable that a new iPhone doesn't cost that much more uh, than $1,000 over two years. Uh, the costs are pretty comparable. Uh, the company's done a pretty good job of keeping things uh, from uh, getting out of hand in terms of uh, the cost. They're expensive phones, uh, that's for sure, but uh, they haven't gone up as much as you'd think they have. What's gone up, of course, is the uh, data plan, uh, so the Rogers data plan or the Bell data plan. So this is like a certainty effect. If you can get a new phone for $0, that's certain. <laughs> I got a new phone. I don't know how much it's going to cost me over the next two years. Uh, and a lot of people don't even think that through, how much it's going to cost to have the phone, because most of us have just decided we're always going to have a smartphone. So we're always going to have this bill. And that is also uh, a type of certainty effect. And so you can see that the way in which options are framed uh, so $199 plus $30 a month versus $399 uh, and $20 a month, the way in which they're framed can really change the way in which uh, you make decisions. That's what I want to talk about next are framing effects. So let's look at these framing effects in more detail. This is a classic example from Kahneman and Tversky's uh, research. Um, I've only changed it by changing the name of the city uh, to make it be our city. I think the original example said something like, imagine that your city is preparing for the outbreak of a disease. What they did, what Kahneman and Tversky did, was that they came up with um, an interesting way to present the same information in two different semantic contexts, two, two different semantic frames. Uh, and it changes the way in which people make choices, it changes the way in which you make a decision. So let's look at this example. Uh, let's look at each of these examples, uh, and then we'll look at everything all together and look at the possible choices. So imagine that London is preparing for the outbreak of a disease. This disease will kill 600 people if left untreated. Uh, so two programs to combat the disease have been proposed. Option number one, so program number one, 200 people will be saved. Sounds great. Um, option number two, or B, uh, there will be a one-third probability that 600 people will be saved and a two-third probability that no people will be saved. Which of these two choices sounds better? Um, they found that the majority of their subjects liked option A, right, because 200 people will be saved. You don't want to take a risk, um, and you look at option B, by the way, uh, there's a two-thirds probability, so 66% that no people are going to be saved. Nobody wants to take that risk. 
Uh, so you say, let's do this. We're going to save 200 people. Uh, and that's the choice that most people in this experiment uh, chose. That's, that's the decision that most uh, people chose. They chose option A. Let's look at a different frame, though. It's going to be the same numbers, uh, the same uh, numbers of, uh, you know, saved and not saved, and same probabilities, uh, but it's going to be framed in a different way. So again, imagine that London is preparing for the outbreak of a disease that will kill 600 people. Two programs to combat the disease have been proposed. C, this is the first of the two, 400 people will die. This does, this does not sound good. Um, D, there will be a one-third probability that nobody will die and a two-thirds probability that 600 will die. Um, what they found in this frame uh, is that most people will choose the riskier alternative. They will choose option D. Although there's a two-thirds probability that 600 are going to die, there's a one-third probability that nobody will die. It's your only chance to save people. Uh, no one likes, well, most people, most of their participants did not like option C that suggested 400 people will die. If you're the leader, public health leader, and you say, we're going to choose option C, which means 400 people will die, it's not a very good choice. It doesn't sound good, and most people don't like the idea of endorsing something uh, that is going to cause a loss. So let's look at both of them together. Um, in the first two, uh, it's framed as saving. So it's framed as a gain. It's framed as something good. Uh, option A means that if you choose option A, that you're going to save 200 people, that does mean that 400 people will die. But when it's framed as saving, people stick with certainty, and they show something called risk avoidance. Uh, in other words, they're unwilling to do that riskier alternative, uh, you know, the 33% chance that you would save everybody, uh, because they're attracted to the a reduction of uncertainty. They're attracted to the certainty of saving 200 people. In other words, when the choice is framed as a gain, uh, many of us will choose a certain outcome, and we will avoid risk. We will show risk avoidance uh, when we're uh, faced with certainty. In other words, we avoid the uncertainty uh, in this case. But when framed in a different way, when framed as loss, uh, people do not like loss. We don't like risk. Uh, we don't like uncertainty, but most of us really don't like loss. Loss avoidance is a really strong effect for most of us. We just don't like to lose what we already have. Uh, so when it's framed as uh, a loss or framed as dying, um, people choose that riskier alternative. Notice that A and C are exactly the same. Uh, when it's framed as saving, people will choose it. When it's framed as losing, in other words, 400 people dying, uh, people will avoid it, uh, and they will choose the riskier alternative. So people will make that risky choice uh, in this case because they want to avoid a loss. When you're backed into a corner and you're faced with the possibility of losing something, you're willing to take more risks. And that's one of the things that Kahneman and Diversky found. That's one of the things that they're most well remembered for. Um, and we'll come back to this in a few slides when we talk about how their, their theory, prospect theory, explains these kinds of uh, decisions. But let's move on to some, another idea. I want to move on to base rate neglect. We did cover this a little bit last week, uh, but I want to cover it again. So base rate neglect means exactly what it says. Uh, when you're given the base rate, uh, in other words, the base rate of occurrence or the underlying uh, probability of something happening, uh, we often neglect it. We often ignore it in our choices and we ignore it in our decision making because we reason uh, and make decisions from memory or we reason and we make decisions from categorical knowledge. We saw this example last week. This is the example with Jack, uh, the lawyer or engineer. Uh, and remember, we said that you know, this is, a, again, a study from Kahneman and Tversky. Uh, there's 100 people in a room, 70 of them are lawyers, and 30 are engineers. And you're suggesting, and we suggest to you, as a subject in this experiment, you've got 100 people, you know that the base rate of lawyers is 70 to 30 engineers. So lawyers are more likely. 70% of these people are lawyers, only 30% are engineers. You meet Jack, 
45-year-old married man with four kids, conservative, careful, and ambitious, shows no interest in social and political issues, spends a lot of time doing carpentry, woodworking, sailing, and computers. And what Kahneman and Tversky found is that most people think uh, that this activates their category or their stereotype mm -hmm. of an engineer. And so they're more likely to say that he's an engineer, despite the fact that the base rates should suggest that he is a lawyer, right? Uh, doesn't sound like a lawyer. Maybe he sounds more like an engineer. Uh, but overall likelihood, the overall probability, uh, is that he's a, he's a lawyer. Uh, and this is an example of base rate neglect. We neglect the base rate uh, and make the decision or make the uh, inference based on our understanding of a category or a concept. Kahneman and Tversky called this the representativeness heuristic. Uh, and it predicts that people respond to category similarity and not probability. Jack is just representative uh, of the engineer category. They further suggested that representativeness means that things should look like members of their category. So if you uh, know that someone is an engineer, you expect them to act like your stereotype of an engineer. If you know someone is a law enforcement uh, uh, agent, if you know someone's a police officer, if you know someone's a professor, you know someone is a physician, you expect them to be representative of the category that you know that they're a member of. And oftentimes they are, but we all have a lot of individual differences. Uh, and so sometimes this can produce an error. We talked about another one uh, a few uh, weeks ago as well, last week. And this has to do with our uh, understanding or our concept of something that's supposed to be random. So if I give you three possible coin tosses, so you just toss in a coin and you're recording heads or tails. So the H is one coin toss and the T is another coin toss. So this is a sequence of flipping the coin six times. You flip it up and you see whether it comes down heads or tails and you record it. Uh, the first one, uh, let's suppose that you flip it six times, and you get heads, tails, heads, tails, heads, tails. Does that seem random to you? Well, most people, uh, if they're asked to rate this on a scale of one to seven for how random it seems, it doesn't seem very random. It's too regular. It's heads, tails, heads, tails, heads, tails. That doesn't seem like something that would come up if you're randomly uh, flipping a coin. Uh, similarly, six heads in a row seems something kind of suspicious about that. Uh, if you're, you know, if you're uh, trying to see who gets a home field advantage or see who gets the ball first and you're flipping a coin for that in a sporting event and your team always ends up winning the coin toss six times in a row, people are going to take notice of that. They're going to think there's something wrong. Um, the third one, which is heads, tails, tails, heads, tails, heads, just strikes most people as more random. So most of us would favor that as being the most random looking, even though we know that all of them are equally probabilistic. They're all equally likely if it's a coin toss, right? Each time you toss the coin, it has a 50% chance of coming up heads or tails. And so the first one, the second one, and the third one have exactly the same uh, probabilities. This is one example of a gambler's fallacy. Uh, we assume that randomness should look a certain way. Uh, we assume uh, that randomness should be uh, you know, should not appear to have something that we think is a pattern. The first two appear to be non-random. Uh, and so we might expect, after all of those heads, the next one to be tails. Uh, you might be more willing to bet money uh, that the outcome of, you know, for each of these three, uh, that middle one that's all heads, and I ask you to place a bet on what the next coin toss would be, most of us would feel very strongly about betting more on the tails outcome because the idea of getting seven heads in a row just seems unbelievable, whereas we would be less willing to make a bet on that bottom one, even though it's exactly the same. It's the same bet in each case. Uh, they all have the same uh, probability, but we're willing to sort of adjust our ex expectations based on what we think randomness looks like. So most of you probably still remember back, um, back in the days, I think this was before COVID, uh, when you go to Tim Hortons and you get a cup of coffee and it was called the roll up the rim thing. You all know roll up the rim, right? Now it's roll up the virtual rim, but for a while it was literally rolling up rims on your actual coffee cup. 
uh, during COVID because people didn't want to return. <laughs> they didn't want you to give back a cup that you had drank out of that had a rolled up thing on it. They started switching to different ways to do it. But um, you used to roll it up and you would get usually a free coffee, usually nothing. Uh, it would say, you know, play again. Um, but sometimes you could win actual money, right? Most of us, if we did, we just got a free coffee. So one year, a few years ago, uh, I had a particularly bad string of luck, and I tracked uh, every <laughs> every roll. Uh, I had to backtrack a little bit to figure out how many I had actually done, but it turns out I had done quite a lot of rolling up the rim without winning anything. So this is about five or six years ago, um, and this shows that I bought over a sequence of about a month uh, 35 cups of coffee from Tim Hortons. This was when there was a Tim Hortons outlet in the Social Science Center, uh, and I was teaching in social science, so I would buy a cup of coffee before every class. Uh, and what you see at the top is the uh, probability of a loss. So in other words, rolling up the rim and not winning anything on any individual. That's the independent probability. So it was about 90% of the time. Uh, so I think at that time, the odds were uh, uh, something like uh, one in every 10 was a winner. So basically, most of them were not winners. Uh, so it was a 90% chance of not winning anything. And you can see down at the bottom, the square is the probability, independent probability of a win. Uh, so that uh, empty square at the bottom is on every cup that I bought, it should have been about uh, a one out of 10 or a one per, or 10% chance of rolling up the rim and winning something, usually a free coffee. Mm -hmm. But then I calculated my uh, successive, the probability of successive wins and my uh, string of losses. And you could see that the probability of successive wins, remember this is multiplying the probabilities, uh, started to decrease. In other words, the chance of losing once is 90%, the chance of losing twice is 80%, and it goes down uh, pretty quickly. So that by the time you've purchased 20 cups of coffee, uh, the probability of getting that string of bad luck is now lower than the probability of a single win. Uh, and that's when it started to feel wrong to me. Even though I know that what I was experiencing was something that was probable, uh, it started to feel as if I was in the range of uh, not, uh, felt like I was getting cheated. Uh, I thought, you know, one out of every 10 should be a win. I've now purchased 10 cups of coffee and I haven't won anything. I've now purchased 20 cups of coffee and I haven't won anything. I've now purchased 30 cups of coffee and I haven't won anything. And one of the things that you can see is that the, trajectory of losses starts to get close to the trajectory of successive wins. In other words, the probability of that many losses in a row is not that much different than the probability of that many wins in a row. Uh, this was an example of a gambler's fallacy because I kept thinking at any given moment now, uh, I'm going to win. Uh, and it started to feel like it was not a very random process. Eventually, I did uh, win a single free cup of coffee uh, on the 36th uh, cup of coffee that I purchased. So that cup of coffee, that free cup, cost an awful lot of money. You can see that the expected value here was not very good. Um, we also talked last week a little bit about availability. Um, availability is another heuristic we use because um, we're not good at using probability. Uh, and so we're not good at making decisions around uh, combining probability with gains and losses. We're good at making decisions around things that we are familiar with. And availability just means that we use information available in our memory. We use the ease to which something is brought to mind as a cue to answer the question or to make a decision. We talked a little bit about this one last week, but let's look in greater detail at the experiment that uh, Tversky and Kahneman did. So this goes all the way back to 1973, but keep in mind that Tversky and Kahneman have more, you know, more recently uh, been awarded the Nobel Prize in economics for some of their work showing that people do not behave rationally. Um, and this is one of their earliest papers looking at the availability heuristic. Uh, here's just one example. So their subjects, uh, they recruited uh, over 100 subjects, and they were just given a simple decision. You will be given several letters of the alphabet and you will be asked to judge whether these letters appear more often in the first or third position and to estimate the ratio of frequency 
with which they appear in these positions. A typical problem would be, consider the letter R. Is R more likely to appear in the first position of words or in the third position of words? And my estimate for the ratio of these two values is something to one. And here's what they found. Among 152 subjects, 105 judged the first position to be more likely for the majority of letters, and 47 judged the third position to be more likely. The bias favoring the first is highly significant, and moreover, each of the five letters which judged by a minor majority of subjects to be more frequent uh, than the first and the third position at a two to one ratio. Um, and this was, they found that people made this decision despite the fact that all of the letters were actually you know, in the English language that they were testing in, were more frequent in the third position. So the correct answer is third position, but most of their subjects uh, chose first position. The explanation that K Tversky and Kahneman gave, and that we talked about last week, is that we don't think of words by thinking of them from the letter that's in the third position. So when you're considering R, uh, the first thing you do is think about all the words you know that begin with R. And that's easy to do because that's how we search our mental lexicon. That's how we search our memories for words, is to think of them by the first letter that they begin with. And so what happens is most people uh, are able to bring to mind more letters, more words that begin with R in the first position, than they are able to bring to mind words with R in the third position. And so that first position just seems more likely. I want to talk about uh, two more uh, biases, and then we're going to briefly talk about prospect theory, uh, and then one final uh, idea about satisficing. So these kinds of biases are all around us. Uh, another common one is called a sunk cost, which uh, sometimes you hear referred to as an entrapment effect. And it sort of works like this. I mean, imagine you spend, let's say, $12 to see a movie. I think it's, maybe I should have paid this slide. It costs more than $12 to see a movie. Uh, $12 to see a movie, but in the first half hour, you, you just know it's horrible. It is just not something that you can watch, whether it's too frightening, too boring, uh, too violent, uh, or too silly, or just not your thing. Uh, sometimes it happens, right? You go to see a movie and you think, this is just not any good. But most people, when asked, uh, would you stay or would you go, uh, will say that they would like to stay. Uh, most people will think, well, I've sp spent my $12. I'm staying anyway, even though I don't like this movie. And that's the reason that most people give. And this is known as a sunk cost. Once you've spent the money, uh, you make the decision to stay because you can't justify leaving. You can't justify leaving that $12. You're now $12 in the hole. Uh, and that suggests that uh, in order to get your investment back, you need to sit through the movie even if you know you're not going to like it. So most of us will act against our best interests. It's a simplified example, but think about all of the other cases where this, uh, where this often comes up. Uh, the sunk cost, and again, I said this is sometimes called uh, an entrapment effect, uh, is a reluctant to give up any kind of invested time or money. Um, any time, have you ever had to call someone uh, on a helpline, a, like a telephone, uh, maybe to call about u utilities or to call about uh, your cell phone or your smartphone plan or something like that? You got to call Bell or got to call Rogers. It doesn't matter what time of the year or what time of the day that you call. Uh, the message is almost always the same. Uh, the message says, you know, thank you for calling. We are currently experiencing high volume of calls, uh, and you may have a delay. Uh, you know, th there may be a delay. The estimated time is, and then they'll give you something like 45 minutes, and you think, oh, 45 minutes. How can I wait 45 minutes? Now, if we were in class and not on, a rec on this recording, I would ask you, how many of you have waited over 30 minutes? And I'd ask you to put up your hand. And I would say, how many of you have ever waited over 40 minutes? over an hour. And usually there's somebody <laughs> who said they have to wait over an hour. Uh, and what often is true is that the longer you wait, the more reluctant you are to hang up. Uh, if, you know, the message you get says, uh, you know, we're currently experiencing high volume of calls. The estimated time is 65 minutes. And you would say, there's no way I'm waiting 65 minutes. You just hang right up. If they don't say that, and you've now waited for 45 minutes or 50 minutes, 
you probably think, well, I've waited 40 minutes. I've waited 45 minutes. I'm not going to give up now. <laughs> I'm not getting that time back. I'm going to stay on the line now because any minute now they're going to come on. Uh, and that's an example of a sunk cost. You've now wasted 45 minutes on hold. Uh, you're not going to give up that easily. And the longer you wait, the harder it is to give up. And you can see this with investments, uh, with personal relationships. Maybe you stay in a personal relationship longer than you'd like to because it's you know, the prospect of not having a relationship seems more fearful. And so you're willing to put up with a partner, whether it's a friendship or a romantic partner, uh, of someone that you are maybe not that closely invested with uh, longer. And the longer you stay with them, the more likely you are to stay with them, the more you feel like you've sunk something. All-you-can-eat buffets uh, is another one that I thought about is – uh, if you've spent $45 on a buffet, you feel like you want to get at least $45 worth of food. Uh, gym memberships are the same thing. If you're spending money, you feel like you've spent all that money on the gym for the year. Uh, you don't want to give it up now because otherwise you would have you know, sort of faced with the prospect of having lost all of that money. Let's look at one more example of this type of uh, thing, and then we'll move on to a description of prospect theory. Here's a nice example from Tversky and Kahneman. It kind of puts these things together, and it sort of shows just the types of decisions that we make. Um, let's look at one of the examples uh, of the paper. So this is, by the way, a paper where they present subjects with lots of different uh, prospects and lots of different decisions to make. Uh, and they find that, for the most part, there's never a right answer. It's not like everybody chooses one alternative or the other, but what they find is that people can show different preferences or they can shift uh, their preferences based on the way that things are framed. So here's another example. So they say problems eight and nine illustrate another class of situations in which an existing account affects a decision. Problem eight, the end is 183 people were asked this question. Imagine that you have decided to see a play where admission is $10 per ticket. As you enter the theater, you discover you have lost a $10 bill. Would you still pay $10 for a ticket to the play? And the majority of their subjects say yes. Uh, so getting ready to go see the play, uh, they've, um, they've got their money, uh, they're going to pay in cash, they show up, and they're like, oh, I lost $10, but you know what? I, I still have money. <laughs> uh, I will buy another ticket. Uh, or I will buy a ticket um, with uh, another $10 bill, right? It's not a problem. Sometimes you lose things. Um, but notice what happens when they change the way in which it was uh, described. Now, here's 200 people were asked this question. Imagine that you have decided to see a play and paid the admission price of $10 per ticket. You've already paid. As you enter the theater, you discover that you have lost your ticket. You're like, I, I, where'd my ticket go? The seat was not marked and the ticket cannot be recovered. Would you go back and spend $10 for another ticket? And here they find a reversal. It's not a big reversal, but they find that 54% of the subjects would not go back and buy another ticket. Something about having the ticket itself, they've endowed it with more value uh, than the actual uh, ticket uh, cost. So it's somehow worth more uh, than $10 because they've lost it. Losing the ticket seems to count more uh, than not having it. The marked difference between the response to problem 8 and 9 is an effect of psychological accounting. We propose that the purchase of a new ticket uh, is entered into the account, so the mental account, that was set up by the purchase of the original ticket. In terms of this account, the expense required to see the show is $20, uh, a cost at which many of our respondents apparently found excessive. In other words, it's the same, it's the same thing. Uh, so everyone's still spending $10 for that ticket. The first person has already lost 10 has lost $10, uh, but still buys a $10 ticket, the second person is paying for the same ticket twice. Uh, in terms of overall uh, money in and money out, they're equivalent, but the second feels psychologically more uh, of a cost. It's more of a loss. You've now lost the ticket. So based on this kind of research, and based on the research that we discussed earlier on sunk cost effects, and on the availability heuristic, and the um, representativeness heuristic, and all of these certainty effects, and all of these kinds of things where people don't seem to be behaving rationally, uh, Kahneman and Tversky came up with an alternative. And they called this alternative 
prospect theory. Uh, and the idea is that you uh, evaluate things based on their prospect rather than based on their expected value. Um, the expected utility or expected value of something is adjusted for a reference point. Uh, so in other words, a loss of 600 versus a loss of 400, that changes the way in which you calculate the expected value or the expected utility of an outcome. And second, the second big difference between this and the rational model is that the objective probability, so knowing the actual base rates or the actual probability of occurrence, is replaced by a psychological probability. In other words, kind of what we talked about last week, uh, our basic observations of the world, uh, our memory for things, uh, is a psychological estimate of probability uh, based on what you remember. And we remember the times that were successful. We don't remember the times that were not successful. Uh, so our probability estimates are often skewed. Uh, and they've suggested that this model really accounts for the two things that people seem to show very strongly when they deviate from rationality, and that is loss aversion and risk aversion. We don't like to risk things, and we really don't like to lose things. The one thing that looms the largest in this research is the idea of loss aversion. Uh, we are aversive to losing what we already have. And that's kind of the example that we saw previous. And once you've lost a ticket, uh, it feels like you've lost more than just $10. Uh, they kind of explain this by, uh, calc by suggesting that we calculate a value function rather than an expected value uh, by calculating the, uh, the gains and losses and the probabilities as we did in the rational model. This value function uh, has a couple of different characteristics to it. So two things I want you to pay attention to. First, are, first off, this curve uh, is not symmetrical. Uh, notice that the top half curves a little bit more gradually than, this, than the bottom half. The bottom half drops off more steeply. Um, and second, uh, they sort of asymptote. In other words, it's not a linear function. Uh, values with gain, you know, the psychological value that you place on gains and losses is not linear. Uh, it's adjusted for this psychological reference point. So this idea that the uh, value you place on anything, whether it's a gain or a loss, is eventually going to reach an asymptote. In other words, eventually it's going to flatten out. That one principle, combined with the second principle, the idea that these two curves are asymmetrical, predicts things like loss aversion. So what I've labeled on this, for example, is the impact, uh, the actual value. So that y-axis is the psychological impact. That's the value that you place on gains and losses, the value that you place on these prospects. The x-axis uh, shows the objective gain and loss. So let's look at just one straightforward, simple example here. Um, I've labeled on the x-axis a gain or a loss of $100. Uh, one thing you'll probably note here uh, is that this shows this kind of illustrates why we would show loss aversion. Or this illustrates the phenomenon of loss aversion. A gain of $100, that's good. You know, anytime you have extra, extra cash flow, uh, you feel good about it. So uh, you've gained $100, and that's shown on that x-axis. That's $100 up. Uh, and it, you give to it some kind of value. The prospect of losing $100, though, seems to have a much bigger negative value. Uh, it is further down on that y-axis. In other words, a gain of $100 is not as good as a loss of $100 is bad. Or another way of putting it, I like to gain $100, but I would hate to lose $100 even more. We're aversive to the loss. As much as I like the gain, the loss feels worse. And this is one of the key things that Kahneman and Tversky discovered uh, in a lot of their research with human uh, participants and human behavior. Uh, we don't like to lose what we already have. Uh, we don't like the uncertainty of knowing what it's going to be like without the thing that we already have. I want to talk about one final example here, and this goes back to something we actually talked about, I think, on maybe the first or the second class uh, in this course, uh, and that's the idea of satisficing. One of the reasons I want to bring this up is that these theories, whether it's uh, the rational model or Kahneman and Tversky's prospect theory, uh, the rational model suggests that we should behave in a certain way. We should make rational decisions. 
prospect theory suggests, well, we don't make rational decisions. We make lots of mistakes. We make lots of errors. Satisficing is one alternative that suggests that both of these things might be uh, working together uh, and that we might be better served by not worrying <laughs> about trying to make the best decision all the time. Uh, satisficing goes back to the research of uh, Herbert Simon, who was a cognitive scientist and an artificial intelligence researcher during the first wave of AI. Uh, and the suggestion is that most of us, uh, when we're making decisions, we just often choose the first option that is satisfactory. Uh, we don't always need to find the best outcome. We don't always need to make the best decision. Uh, sometimes we just need to have a criterion and we need to have a goal and we find an option that satisfies that goal and we move on. Uh, it means that you've sacrificed, perhaps, um, the, uh, the guarantee of always having the best outcome. Maybe you're not going to have, uh, you haven't allocated your time in the way that's, that's the best. Maybe you've made some decisions to cut some of the studying on one of your courses to focus on a different one. Uh, Maybe you've made maybe you've made the wrong choice. Uh, maybe you've uh, you know you've decided to spend time uh, doing something that seems a little bit more fun this weekend uh, than to maybe uh, focus on your studies. But maybe at the time it seemed like the better choice. Uh, there was something satisfactory about the time that you spent. Uh, satisficing means doesn't mean just giving up. <laughs> uh, it doesn't mean choosing bad options. It means choosing good options, but not necessarily placing the focus on choosing the objectively best option. So unlike the rational model, a satisficing based approach would assume that you're not seeking uh, the best option. Uh, you're seeking one of many good options. This is an example I think it works pretty well. Uh, imagine that you're a manager at a supermarket and you need someone to bag the groceries. Uh, you're working at a supermarket that, well, this was an example that actually worked pretty well when supermarkets gave out grocery bags. Uh, most supermarkets don't give you a grocery bag. You got to bring your own. So let's assume that you still have someone hired. This is not a no frills. This is a high frills environment. Uh, or even Costco, for example. You go to Costco, uh, there's always someone there to put your stuff in a cart. So you want to hire someone uh, who can do that. That's going to be their main job. Uh, they're going to be putting groceries in the bag so that the bag isn't overflowed, the groceries don't get crushed, um, and they got to work fast. Uh, now, I, I can tell you, as someone who worked at the front end of a grocery store when I was in university, uh, it can be a challenging job from time to time. You've got to work fast, but it's not necessarily a job that requires a unique skill set. Uh, lots of people can do a good job at this. So if you're the manager and you need someone to bag groceries and 100 people apply, you could interview all 100 of them uh, and give them a skills test and find out which of the 100 is the best uh, bag grocery bagger. That person may exist. There may be a best person out there. Um, but the cost of hiring the not best, <laughs> uh, maybe there's some, maybe, you know, the cost of hiring someone who isn't the absolute best of the 100 is probably pretty low because most people could probably do this reasonably well. The difference between the best and the worst is probably not that much. Um, so you might just take the first person who is at the top of the stack or the first person who applied or the first person who looks like they could reasonably do the job uh, for an extended period of time. That's a satisficing approach. That means that you've, you're going to you know, sacrifice a little bit. Uh, you're not going to find the optimal person. You're not guaranteed to find the optimal person, but you are guaranteed to find somebody a little bit sooner. Uh, so what you gain uh, is the benefit of not spending all of that time and resources and effort uh, trying to evaluate all of the options. Rather than evaluating all of the options, you say, I've got something in mind. I think I know what is needed for a grocery bagger. Here is an, uh, a, you know, here's an application for a person. I'm going to interview them. If they can do the job, they've got it. Uh, and that gets you on your day a little bit more quickly. Um, Barry Schwartz and a few other uh, psychologists have found that most people uh, are a little bit of both. Uh, there's lots of times when we want to maximize our investments. There's lots of times when we want the optimal outcome. But there's also lots of times when we're 
comfortable not having the best. Uh, we're comfortable finding something that is reasonable. But what they found is that most people uh, who are satisfizers, who tend to be primarily oriented towards satisficing, are generally a little bit happier. Uh, maximizers are less satisfied. On the surface, that seems to make sense, right? If you're, you know, if you're consumed or if you uh, place a high preference on finding the best outcome, the best uh, applicant, the best uh, outfit, uh, the best investment, a lot of times you're going to be wrong and your life satisfaction uh, is going to have higher levels of regret uh, and unhappiness. So maximizing perfectionists don't always doesn't always work, and so there's, you're more likely to be unhappy. Uh, this has been described by some as the agony of perfectionism. Uh, to get the best deal or to get the best outcome, uh, it can be really difficult. And you've probably seen this kind of thing whenever you go shop, uh, whether you're shopping online on Amazon or shopping in person at Shoppers Drug or uh, at Costco or Target or anywhere else. Uh, trying to find the best deal can be tiring. There are so many different options. There are so many different choices uh, that it can be really difficult. Uh, you can be paralyzed by how much decision space there is. A satisfying approach releases you from some of that. Or, as some individuals have said, a good enough strategy is a smarter decision. And this is from a consumerist uh, perspective. Uh, Barry Schwartz suggests uh, sometimes having fewer choices uh, can help you make better decisions. So let's wrap this up. Uh, if we were doing this in person, we probably would have had a slightly longer lecture, but uh, I recognize this is a, uh, a different format. Uh, so there wasn't as much time for question and answer. There wasn't as much time for uh, some back and forth. So let me wrap this up a little bit, and I'm hoping to see everyone uh, in person uh, in a few days. Were, uh, if we were in person, this probably would have been a slightly longer lecture. I recognize that uh, this is a different format, so there wasn't as much time for uh, back and forth. But I'm looking forward to seeing everybody in just a few days. Um, so first of all, just take the time to think through some of the important decisions that you make. Uh, satisficing can work well for a lot of things, but there are lots of decisions where you really do want to uh, think about some of the potential outcomes. If this might have to do with uh, big life decisions like um, you know, relocation and employment decisions and large financial decisions and also decisions uh, that inter, you know, that, that affect other people around you, people that you love. Um, you want to take the time to think through some of those. But you also want to recognize your limitations and biases. Uh, so recognize when you're making a decision based on representativeness or when you're making a decision based on availability. Uh, and you might want to sometimes uh, consider a satisficing approach uh, if that seems like the best alternative. All right, thanks everyone, uh, and I'll look forward to seeing you in just a few days, uh, and I hope you enjoyed this, uh, ho hope you enjoyed doing the lecture in this format. Take care.